Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm calling to order the April 6, 2023 City of Calabasas Planning Commission meeting. I'm joined, I'm Michael Harrison. I'm joined by Vice Chair Leah, uh, Commissioners Byrne, Fassberg, and Alternate Commissioner Mueller. Um, Commissioner Washburn is joining us via Zoom. I'm, I'm reading this, I was asked to read this. So the Brown Act authorizes members of the Planning Commission to participate in meetings remotely under certain conditions. Assembly Bill 2449, which was signed into law by Governor Newsom on September 13, 2022, and became effective January 1, 2023, permits commissioners to, to participate in commission meetings remotely when they can demonstrate just cause or emergency circumstances and when a quorum of the commission is physically present in the city. Commissioner Washburn is participating in today's meeting remotely under AB 2449. Commissioner Washburn is participating, participating under the emergency circumstances, uh, circumstances exception given health reasons. Commission sorry, I don't know, uh, uh, will be participating in today's meeting using audiovisual technology per AB 2449. A commissioner participating remotely due to, um, due to emergency circumstances requires commission consent. So I'll ask if there's any opposition to this request. No, 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 no of course not. Um, so seeing none, we will proceed. Commissioners participating remotely under AB 2449 are required to disclose at the start of the meeting whether any other individuals 18 years of age or older are present in the room at the remote location with the commissioner and the commissioner's relationship with the individual or individuals. Commissioner Washburn, if you're there, um, would you please confirm that you are the only person 18 years of 18 years or older in the room uh, you are teleconferencing from or else disclose those persons over 18 present with you. Yes, I'm broadcasting from my home office and there's no one here except me. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Good to see you. You bet. Sorry, this is a formality we have to do. As I understand fully. Thank you. As required by AB 2449, all votes taken today will be done by roll call. Um, all right. Anyway, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a little, uh, it's going to take a little adjustment because we haven't been meeting in person for three years. So um, this is, uh, it's going to take a little um, ad adapting. So uh, the first, on, first item on the agenda is call to order, and we're all here. Um, then we get to the Pledge of Allegiance, and um, it's nice to be able to do it in person for a change. Um, uh, Wendy, could you could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Hand over heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brilliant. All right, thank you, Wendy. Um, next is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Oh, oh, I have to do roll call on every every item, huh? Yeah, because we're oh. under the AB two four four nine process. Oh. All right, Commissioner Fassberg. Yes, aye. Uh, Commissioner Byrne. Aye. Um, I guess we go to uh, Commissioner Leah. Yes. And I and I I'm yes. And, oh, and Commissioner Washburn. Yeah. Aye. All right. Sorry about that. Not a problem at all. Next is uh, next item is announcements and introduction. So, uh, Commissioner Thetford, do you have any announcements? I do not. It's just uh, it's. I'd like to say it's great to be back. I think it's great to be back. It's weird to be back. So it's good. It's good to see you all in person, though. So. <laughs> Good to be back. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Byrne, any announcements? Uh, no announcements, thanks. Uh, Commissioner uh, Muller? Uh, no announcements. 
Thank sure. you, Mr. Alia. And uh, Dennis, can you hear me? Um, I can, and uh, I do have a couple of announcements. I want to thank everybody uh, for allowing me to participate in this manner. And today is Tartan Day, and I'm wearing my Tartan shirt <laughs> and wishing everybody also a very happy Passover season and Easter coming up. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. And yes, happy Passover, happy Easter, blessed Ramadan. Um, next, uh, we have oral communications, which is public comment for matters that are not on our agenda. Does anybody wish to speak? Anybody out there wish to speak on some item that's not on our agenda? No? All right. So then we move on to a presentation. Um, are we going to be having a presentation from the Water District now? Yes. Uh, we have Ricky Clark from the Water District. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops. No, I think we would do the presentation first, then the minutes. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Oh, yeah. It says presentation, then the consent items. So, but, oh. or at least that's what I have. So, yes. Okay. So, uh, waiting to speak and able to I present um, from the Water District by Zoom is Ricky Clark, the Public Affairs Associate for the district. And uh, I believe you're unmuted. So, go right ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good evening to the Planning Commission. Thank you for having me. My name is Ricky Clark, um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about our Pure Water Project. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a very brief presentation that includes a couple of video clips, and so I will make sure to share with sound. Okay, can everyone see that full screen all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Where are you guys didn't hear me? Okay, so thank you for having me again. Um, I represent Los Virginis Municipal Water District, but today I will actually be speaking on behalf of the Los Virginis Trianfo Joint Powers Authority, which is our partnership uh, with Trianfo Water and Sanitation District. And I'm going to be talking about our Pure Water Project, which is set to bring the region a new reliable supply of water beginning in 2028. So just a little bit of background, of course, Los Virginis is the water district that provides all drinking water, wastewater, composting services, and recycled water services to the city of Calabasas. We also serve Hidden Hills, Westlake Village, Agora Hills, and some unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County, um, namely in the Chatsworth area. Okay. So this is a really big uh, point, essentially. Uh, we are 100% reliant on imported water that we buy from Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. So we do not have any local supply of water. And um, just a little bit of, of history here that I'm, I'm sure um, Dennis Washburn will appreciate. Uh, really, the formation of this area um, was because we wanted to maintain our own area. We do not want to be annexed by uh, the city of Los Angeles. And the main thing that you need to do that is a reliable water source. And so that's how Los Virginia's Municipal Water District was formed. We were also formed by the same group of people who formed the school district. And so again, no groundwater or any local source of water, drinking water, at least right now. Um, and that's what this uh, new pure water project is going to provide. We serve about 25,000 acre feet of water annually, both drinking water or potable water and recycled. Um, I mentioned that we formed the JPA, that's who I'm presenting on behalf of today. And then finally, with through our partnership with the JPA, we actually serve a total of around 105,000 people. And those services highlighted here via our facilities include drinking water, that's our Westlake Reservoir um, up in the city of Westlake. Of course, wastewater and sewage services, that's our Tapia Wastewater Treatment Facility. And then we also offer composting services highlighted here at our Rancho Los Virginis composting facility. And then, as I mentioned, our recycled water services that we offer to not just our commercial customers, but now to also our uh, residential customers who are able to pick up that recycled water any day of the week to apply to their landscapes so that they can save that drinking water for higher uses. So a little bit of background into the Pure Water Project. Um, you have to start with the creek. Malibu Creek is the creek um, in our watershed. It actually sits right next to Tapio Wastewater Facility. 
Um, and we have a large hand in watershed protection and the protection of that creek in particular. And so we essentially use the creek for the purpose of disposing any extra recycled water that we have. Usually in the cooler months, certainly in the months that we just had uh, with these major storms across the state, we just don't have as much of a use for that recycled water for irrigating because we get it for nature. And so when we have an excess of that recycled water, we discharge it into the creek. That also helps to keep those flows in the creek to support the flora and the fauna there. And of course, that goes out into the ocean. Well, back in 2013, the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board actually commissioned the federal EPA to conduct a TMDL, which is essentially a water quality study in that creek, to figure out what was causing a decline in populations of macroinvertebrate. And so the conclusion of that study found that it was our nutrient-rich recycled water that was causing those issues. Um, and they basically gave us uh, sorry about that. They basically gave us an ultimatum. We can either spend hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade tapia so that it's not just a tertiary process. And so that actually the water that's treated there is higher than drinking water standards for humans just to continue discharging into the creek, which eventually goes into the ocean. Or we have to cease discharging into the creek altogether. Obviously, the JPA board would not consider spending all of that money to throw away drinking water. So instead, we opted to cease discharging into the creek by 2030 and to instead essentially reinvest this high quality but not yet drinking water standard water into the pure water project and create a new local supply of water where we do not currently have one. And so just to wrap that up, because I know that there's a lot of technical and water jargon there, essentially the main impetus to this project was regulatory, as are many things in the industry, but the second, I guess, goal of this project is actually a huge deal because it provides a new local supply of water. And indeed, when we have dealt with the ramifications of climate change on our limited water supply, that is something that our region is very much in need of. So a few other considerations that uh, went into the decision for the Pure Water Project include, as I mentioned, improving reliability, making sure that when our one water source from the state water project which delivers that snow melt from the Northern Sierra Nevada mountains is stressed, we are able to have another source to pull from. In the industry, uh, the name of the game is sort of diversifying your sources of water the same way as it is with your stocks. And really groundwater is sort of your crown jewel of water. It's local, it can be recharged, and it also has the lowest cost per acre foot. We unfortunately do not have groundwater. For those of you familiar with the geography of our area, um, our aquifers are ridden with dissolved solids like manganese and phosphate and sulfur. That's just really icky, very costly to treat out, and it's just not feasible to pump. And so we do not use our aquifers. Um, so the next best thing is still a local supply of water that's not coming from the ground, but that's actually coming out of tapia. That water is recycled water, tertiary treated, Title 22. Again, a lot of jargon that basically means that it is a very high quality, very high standard of water. It's clear, it's odorless. It's something called gulpable, meaning if you were to accidentally swallow some of it, you wouldn't get sick. But because California does have such high stringent standards of drinking water as we should, it's not quite there yet, but still very high quality. So by using that water to create a new drinking water supply, we're improving reliability, we're making ourselves more resilient to emergencies. If ever a natural disaster or another extreme drought threatens our one water supply, we'll have another one to pull from. It'll be local. We're also using tried, true, and proven technology that is used all around the world for these same purposes, including on the International Space Station, since they obviously don't have a local source of water. They've been using this process for decades uh, to make sure that they're able to maintain life up in space on the International Space Station. And finally, we uh, sort of keep this term closing the sustainability loop to really highlight how we are trying to have zero waste products in our waste uh, treatment process when it comes to water. Water that used to be wastewater has been turned into recycled water used for irrigation purposes for decades. Now with this process, we'll be able to turn that water back into drinking water, maximizing that beneficial reuse, and again, closing that sustainability loop. So now I just wanna go over the process very quickly to give you guys a nice good understanding of what's happening. 
So here's a quick overview. Um, again, we're starting with recycled water. Um, that is after the tertiary process. Obviously tertiary means three step, but really at our facility, we have added in additional steps to make sure that it's clean, to make sure that we're going above and beyond. We've added pre-treatment. Um, we obviously disinfect it. So this is a very high quality of water that we're starting with. It's gonna go through the three step advanced purification process that consists of membrane ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis filtration, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, and then finally, ultraviolet light and advanced oxidation. Um, and so after this process, what you get is that pure water where there is literally nothing left in that solution but hydrogen and oxygen molecules. That's where the branding comes from. So I wanna go ahead and play a couple clips for the commission that give you a nice visual look at exactly what is happening at each step. Um, so I will go ahead and play this. Reverse osmosis. During microfiltration, water is forced through racks of vessels with each vessel containing thousands of hollow fibers. The outer wall of each fiber is made up of tiny pores, only 0.4 microns in size, or about 300 times smaller than the width of a human hair. These fibers filter out microscopic particles, such as silt, protozoasis, bacteria, and even viruses. Microfiltration vessels are backwashed every 30 minutes to remove any buildup of particles on the membrane walls. The backwash water is returned to the pretreatment tank for reprocessing. This helps the plant recover a higher amount of pure water. So before I move on to the second step, I just wanna add a little bit of context here. In water treatment, we measure the effectiveness of filtration by using the term log removal. And it basically, again, measures how effective we are removing all of the constituents or contaminants in the water. And so the first step here, microfiltration or ultrafiltration, we achieve something called four log removal, which essentially means that we are removing 99.99% .99 of all contaminants from the water just at this first step. So I really wanna emphasize when we say advanced purification, we absolutely mean it. I'll go ahead and move on to our second step, reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis works by forcing water through a special plastic membrane sheet to remove compounds such as salt, organic compounds, microorganisms, viruses, and pharmaceuticals. Rolls of membrane sheets are wound into cylinder-shaped elements. There are several elements inside each long pressure vessel. As water enters the vessels, it flows over the membrane surfaces as it moves from one end of the vessel to the other. The membrane layer is extremely thin, it allows water to pass through or permeate while preventing other compounds from passing through. Membranes remove molecules based on their size, shape, and charge. Generally, contaminants larger than water molecules will not pass through, including most chemical contaminants and all microorganisms such as viruses and bacteria. Two streams of water are produced, pure clean water or permeate flows across the membrane sheets and passes through the membrane layers to the inside core tube. Water that does not permeate becomes more highly concentrated with salts and other substances. This water is called concentrate. The pure permeate water flows out of the core tube at one end of the pressure vessel and the concentrate water flows out another outlet. The concentrate water can then flow into the other pressure vessels for the same process to happen again, so even more pure permeate water can be recovered. About 82% of all the source water becomes purified and again water. here, I like to add, in addition to salts and smaller viruses and chemical contaminants, this is the step that also effectively removes pharmaceuticals from the water that end up in the wastewater. And it also removes PFAS. And for those of you unfamiliar, that is the um, chemical or the scientific term for forever chemicals. So those chemicals that are produced from manufacturing processes, 
um, the molecule or the molecular structure that makes Teflon nonstick, the same thing that makes our clothes flame resistant, the same thing that's in firefighting powder. Um, this uh, chemical is very harmful to our health. Um, it causes a host of issues. This is the step that is scientifically proven in a scalable manner to effectively remove it from the water. So finally, I will move this to our final step, UV disinfection. The next stage is ultraviolet light and advanced oxidation. The water is dosed with hydrogen peroxide and is exposed to strong UV light. This process removes any trace organic molecules. The UV energy instantly destroys the genetic material or DNA of any virus that may have somehow passed through previous barriers. Intense UV light and oxidation breaks down contaminant molecules. The process is similar to ones used in medicine and dentistry to sterilize equipment. So at this point, after these three steps, we are we end with our uh, product, with it, which is that pure water. Um, because pure water is so pure, it's actually considered aggressive. And so you can't drink large amounts of it over a long period of time. So once we go full scale, we will be sending that pure water to that reservoir that I showed you a little bit earlier in the presentation to mix with all of that water that has already been treated so that it can pick up on those minerals and become fortified. At that point, it'll go through treatment one more time at the Westlake filtration plant. And at that point, it'll be re-entered back into our distribution system where it will provide somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of all of our residents and indeed Calabasas residents with a new local supply of drinking water by 2028. But in the meantime, we do have our demonstration facility located at our headquarters in Calabasas where we invite anyone that wants to learn, anyone that might not feel comfortable with this idea, anyone that supports this idea and wants to learn more um, to this facility to learn about it. This is actually a small scale pilot project where we are actively treating the water using this advanced purification system. And so you can see all of the steps here. And at the very end of the tour, the steps over here, we actually um, host tastings. So everyone that comes to learn about the technology and learn about the infrastructure, we essentially invite them for the ultimate trust test for them to taste the water with us. I lead those tours. I taste the water with them every time. Who would I be if I didn't? Um, and this is really a mechanism of, of transparency for the district. We do not want uh, something similar to what happened in the 90s with the pores and the toilet to tap debacle to happen here. And in order to do that, you have to have a properly informed public. You have to lead with transparency. And that's really one of our core beliefs at Los Virginis and why we invested in this facility. So I am giving tours there normally twice a month on Saturdays for the general public and signups are available on our website. Um, and then I also uh, will work with schedules of, of the general public or you know special interest groups. Um, I give tours any and every single day but Sundays. So if someone or a group wanted a tour on a Monday morning or a Monday afternoon or a Thursday afternoon, I do it whenever. It's really important to us that we get people in um, and people are properly informed so that we can build um, and really establish that public trust that you know we, we certainly already have. There's lots of support behind this project. Um, and that's something that was shown uh, during our more recent pure water events. And so some of you might be familiar with these, but last year we hosted a pure water tasting series where we collaborated with local businesses, um, mostly in Calabasas actually. So Calabasas Coffee Company, uh, Tifa Choc Chocolate and Gelato, and then um, Ladyface Brewery in Agora. And we essentially partnered with them to create their products that they sell using our pure water. And then we built an event around each one and we invited the public out. It was completely free. We gave away the gelato. We gave away the coffee. We gave away the beer for free. We invited them to our facility we hosted three tours back to back for the coffee event, five tours back to back for the gelato event. Um, and then we were able to take signups for the beer event. Of course, we had that off site at the brewery. But again, really doing our best to get out there and get this pure water project out there so that folks are properly educated and on board with it. 
before we go full scale. And finally, along with our pure water facility, we also have a demonstration sustainability garden. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, as a result of uh, the most recent droughts, we had to enact some pretty stringent um, watering restrictions because of our reduced allocation from the state. And so as a result of Metropolitan's one day per week watering, a lot of our customers' landscapes um, were effectively either dormant or dead. And so, you know, we wanted to, while we're telling folks that they can't water for this, you know, limited period of time, we want to show them what climate appropriate and many times native and importantly, drought tolerant landscape looks like in action. So we invested in this demonstration garden where anyone can come, learn about the plants there, see the different varieties of plants. If they don't want to do a cactus or a succulent garden, they can get a lush look. They can get lawn alternatives like carafia if they're really married to their grass. Um, basically this entire garden uses way less water than traditional turf. And so we have this as a resource for people to come and learn about. There's also video content for them to learn about on the website. Um, and then we also have accompanying uh, conservation programs to help them implement this at home, including rain barrel giveaways, rebates, our Rachio program and more. So, that is it for my presentation. Thank you guys for lending me some time. And if you had any questions, I am happy to discuss. I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, first, we'll go to questions. Uh, Commissioner Fasper. I, I don't have any questions. I, I That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. It's, it's an exciting, exciting project. And uh, look forward to seeing how, how it develops. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Continue. It's an exciting time. And we just um, put out the RFQ this Monday. So we are now um, starting the process to get contractors for the project. And we are due to break ground on the project in 2025. Terrific. Burn? Yeah, so uh, did I understand that by 2030 that you won't? Yeah, my is that right? Nope. Uh, I'm sorry. The sound cut out a little bit. Uh, there you go. I think the red light means it's on. <laughs> Did I understand that by 2030 that you can't discharge anything to Malibu Creek? Uh, so, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. So by 2030, we will not be allowed to discharge tertiary treated recycled water into Malibu Creek. But we are still mandated to help supplement the flows in Malibu Creek to make sure there's enough water in there for the flora and the fauna. So actually by then we will have to supplement the supply with our drinking water. And we are currently installing hmm. um, breakpoint chlorination infrastructure mm -hmm. that basically treats that water beyond drinking water standards to continue discharging into the creek. So we will still be discharging, it'll just be our drinking water. And that is something that we are mandated to do by the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. Thank you. One more question. Uh, I understand that this water is so pure that it's not really fit for regular human consumption. What is the dilution ratio uh, of the pure water? How many gallons of fresh potable water must you dilute with one gallon of your pure water? Um, of treated water with our pure water. You know, I don't have that that ratio i don't i'm not sure if we do it's it's more of a residency time in our reservoir so there are several different kinds of indirect potable reuse um this one that we're doing specifically is reservoir augmentation meaning that you use this body of water as the environmental buffer so that it can also pick up on those minerals you can also do groundwater um injection but like i mentioned we don't have the aquifers so I'm not sure of that ratio, but I can definitely chat with our engineers and our chief treatment plant operator and follow up with you on that information. Great, thank you. Very good uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Muller. Yes, hi, Ricky, John Muller here, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Um, so physically, where is the plant? Good question. So the plant is going to be on Agora Road, just west of Reyes Adobe. So it's in, it's in Agora Hills, very close to the border, and it's in that undeveloped uh, hilly area right near the Hilton Foundation, if you're familiar with that area. Um, and then the second question is, um, what is the roughly the percent loss? So a, a gallon comes from the 
uh, tertiary treatment into the pure water project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then X percent of that goes into the reservoir. What what yeah. loss are we talking about? It's about eighteen percent, and that happens at the reverse osmosis stage, our second step. Um, we will have about an eighteen percent loss. That's going to be our brine solution. That's going to include all of those chemical uh, contaminants, the pharmaceuticals, the PFAS. That's going to be disposed of via brine disposal pipeline. So we'll have about an eighty-two percent return. We can actually get a little bit higher than that, but it's just not feasible for a seven MGD facility. So we're going to stick around eighty-two percent. And and when you said that our geologic structures are such that we really can't or don't have uh, adequate uh, ability to, to charge groundwater, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? The San Fernando Valley, or just the what Trifuno takes care of, or what area are you talking about? Yeah, the Los Virgenes Conejo region. So Calabasas, Agora Hills, Hidden Hills, and Westlake, our little pocket. Nice. Um, the San Fernando Valley is the LADWP. We unfortunately don't have uh, any claim to that land. But do you But do you believe that the San Fernando Valley for the uh, LA water uh, does have sub- substantial aquifer capacity? Um, they have, yeah, they do. LADWP, I mean, they have a huge swath of, of, of Los Angeles County and they have multiple sources of water. They have groundwater, they have uh, Colorado River water, they have um, the Los Angeles aqueduct from Owens Valley, and then of course the state water project. So they have varied sources um, to serve their population. And I, if- used, to, I used to represent... Um- the coast of Mesa Water District, mm-hmm. and which is, of course, on the coast, yeah, was shocked that a very substantial, I think 50% of their water came from San Gabriel Valley groundwater. Yeah, it's a huge basin. Amazing. It's close to the same. I know, yeah. but it's not that far from the San Gabriel River. Right, the river ends. Val, you know, valley. But yeah, so it's just too bad that we, we don't have that opportunity here, but I believe you're yeah. signing, so. Yeah, okay. and, and again... This area was really adamant about not being annexed by uh, Los Angeles. And so it was important to have our own supply of water, even if it was coming from 440 miles away. And, and you probably already said this, but at the end of the day, when everything's working perfectly, what percent of the uh, of the of the water that will be used within this district comes from the Pure Water Project versus the purchase? Um, so initially when we first started on this project, it was going to be 20%, but because through effective conservation, our entire service area has reduced our water use significantly. So now it's looking like 30% of our drinking water supply. Terrific. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. My questions have been covered. Oh, thank you. Oh, that, okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, Ricky. Thank you for, for your presentation. You mentioned that hydrogen peroxide is added at the last step. Uh, and what happens to that? Okay, that's a great question. Um, hydrogen peroxide is widely used as a disinfection agent in this process, um, but it's interchangeable with sodium hypochlorite, which is basically comparable to household bleach. And we use sodium hypochlorite as a disinfectant agent in all of our other processes. So we're actually going to use sodium hypochlorite. And um, when you use sodium hypochlorite, to disinfect, you can use uh, sodium bisulfite, you add it to it, and then it removes it. Um, but after we send it through our normal drinking water uh, process at Westlake, um, which is diatomaceous earth, we'll only use that sodium bisulfite enough so that there is just a slight uh, chlorine residual left over to make sure that that water is properly disinfected from the time that it leaves our facility to the time that it reaches whatever home it's going to. So we do use sodium bisulfite to remove it, but normally it's, it dissipates on its own because we don't use that much. Oh, okay. Um, has there been any um, planning for a desalination plant um, at, by the water district? Not in our region. So when we decided on the Pure Water Project, it was actually a stakeholder driven process. And we brought in a lot of movers and shakers in our area and in the industry to help um, come to this decision. And one of the many reasons that desal wasn't chosen is because we live in a very um, fragile and very highly protected watershed. And so trying to get a desalination plant in Malibu or even like Point Wine, or Point Port Wyneme, uh presents a lot of environmental challenges. 
Um, also, this is probably the bottom line, uh, an acre foot of water from the desal process costs twice the amount than an acre foot of water from this process. And oh, so it's more economically feasible, um, it's less harmful to the environment, it's less eco ecologically harmful, and it's less energy intensive as well. Okay. And then the last thing is, um, when are you going to have another gelato event? <laughs> <laughs> We just met about that yesterday, actually, and I propose that we have one very soon because I've been hearing this question a lot. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll bring back another gelato event in uh, the summer, but I would keep your eyes peeled for another beer brew event sometime in the fall. Right. I'm sure we're all happy about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for all the work you're doing and bringing the information out to everyone. Yeah. I think that is important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Michael. you for giving me the time. Michael, may I make a few Oh, comments? I'm sorry. I, your picture wasn't there, so I completely forgot. I'm sorry, Dennis. You, you know more about this than all of us, I think. Well, I've been involved right from the, the beginning of wow. the concepts. One of, of the concepts was actually to collaborate with the folks from DWP and Los Angeles and use the Encino Reservoir as one of the storage facilities for whatever is produced out of the process and the systems. And we learned very early on that doing it ourselves was going to be more cost effective and more controllable and more beneficial to the people who have to actually ultimately pay the bill because you know we're going to have to fund this activity and we're doing so now with a significant amount of financial support that our district and the personnel there have been able to muster up i mean we've got you know probably 15 20 million dollars worth of aid to help us get to this point in the first place and yes. probably more to come because, you know, the, the country is, you know, finally waking up to the fact that, you know, we can't just do one direction resource use. We have to figure out how to, you know, bring water full circle in this instance and deal also with our pollutants and so forth. So yeah. uh, economically speaking, this is just one of those things that uh, our people, you know, the folks who are uh, operating the water district in our city, you know, are you know, leading the charge. There are a few cities in California that are doing similar things, Oceanside for one, and there's one up in Monterey Bay that's doing so. Yeah. And uh, the Santa Ana River Watershed Project is recharging their groundwater um, in order to prevent seawater intrusion into their, you know, arable land in the Orange County region. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to know in order to be able to say, what's the best direction? And I think you all know that we as a city and the commissioners actually have been very aggressive in trying to promote the preservation of our very special environment on the planet in the Santa Monica Mountains. And one of the things that, um, you know, has bitten us a little bit, if you think about it, is, you know, it, we made it very difficult to try to build another reservoir anywhere in our mountains or try to take advantage of any existing facilities. If you don't know, we're looking, in fact, have approval to take down the Ringe Dam at the bottom of Malibu Canyon. And, you know, that is going to be happening probably concurrently with us developing our pure water. So, um, you know, it, it, all of those factors make it you know, pretty much like Calabasas always likes to do. And it's like, let's do it ourselves. Let's do it the best way we can. Let's fund it the best that we can. And then let's make it available and uh, manageable and understandable by the people who have to vote to make these decisions and also to you know, pay the bill ultimately. In the long run, this is gonna be a better outcome than we would have had had we been either absorbed by LA or had, you know, if we even partnered with them. And they can probably model their efforts in the San Fernando Valley by looking at us, which is kind of neat. I think Calabasas and the whole region here uh, our council of governments as well. We like being, you know, on the front end of, end of these things. And and uh, Ricky, thank you very much for uh, proving it uh, once again uh, that we are, you know, taking the risk to be up front. Yeah. And I'm going to put in my bid for more uh, pure beer. And you know, <laughs> take that into account. <laughs> I think we got to figure out a way to get it happening in the city of Calabasas and Agoura Hills and Westlake. And yes. uh, we and can we'll chat invite, offline about that. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll invite Hidden Hills to come over and join us and get to be friends on this project. <laughs> Thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
Thank um, you, uh, Dennis. And wait, do you have a do you have another comment? Yeah, I just want to know if the uh, infrastructure or the the lines, the transmission lines, are there in place so that you can get your pure water to the Westlake Reservoir. Or is that something that needs to be done? Some of it is there already. Some of our recycled water pipeline is already in place, but we a part of the whole project scope is uh, developing that additional potable water pipeline to get that water to uh, Westlake and then also additional recycled water pipeline to get it to the new facility. So that's a part of the scope, absolutely. And the last question was, uh, what do you do with the concentrate that comes after you've diluted, after you've removed all the bad stuff, where yeah. does it go? Yeah, so a large part of the scope as well is a brine disposal pipeline and it's about 14 miles long. That's going to connect to an existing brine disposal pipeline owned and operated by Cayegas Municipal Water District, who are our partners in plenty of um, longstanding initiatives. And that outfall is already built out with diffusers and other infrastructure to make sure that the environmental impact is minimal. And that's up in Port Wyneme. So it might seem kind of counterintuitive that we're building a long pipeline to go up and away from the closest water line or the closest shore, but because that infrastructure is already there, it makes it easier. And that's also why they built that brine disposal pipeline with this idea of if you build it, they will come. So we're just going to tap into it and use that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I also want to mention that uh, last Saturday I attended the firescaping uh, presentation at the Water District, which was really quite informative by uh, oh, Doug, Douglas Kent. And um, so I just want to thank you for that. And I know the Water District has slides uh, to, to send to people if they're interested in firescaping and, and his book as well. His book as well. But anyway, thank you for all your work. Uh, also, I, I, oh, I was thinking, uh, Calabasas does have some old wells. I mean, people were here before the Water District, as, as well as Hidden Hills. They, they were on wells. Mm -hmm. until the mid 50s, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So is there any way to recharge them or the groundwater wherever they are? Not that I know of. That might be something that we look into moving forward. Um, Michael, I can answer that for you. Oh, okay. And, and that is that uh, most of the well water that's in the Santa Monica Mountains is highly mineralized. In fact, if you've ever looked at Mulholland Drive, you know, from the crest near Gelson's all the way down to, you know, the uh, El Camino shopping center, there's running wow. rust in the gutters down there. That's from a spring that's coming out of a former huh. uh, source of water that they buried underneath the, uh, the highway and it, it exposes itself. Well, that's very typical. The same thing ha has happened in the past in our old Topanga Canyon area and other areas where there, you know, were very difficult, um, I guess, sanitation issues, and I'm sure you all remember all the issues that we went through in our town regarding septic systems and so forth. So um, it, the, the amount of water is not adequate enough to make it worth anybody's attention. And uh, in fact, we should be warning people not to drink that water more than likely because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a suspicious source of water. So. Okay, yeah. good. Well, thanks for the information. Can I make one more point? And uh, that is the, the wisdom of the process of not just the water district, but the community itself. Um, when we were being when we were being forced to spend perhaps the same amount of money just to clean up the water so we could dump it in the Pacific Ocean and run it through Malibu, about the same amount of money is what's ultimately going to be needed in order to build the system that you know provides us with a recirculation system essentially forever. So it, it was a real bargain to recognize that if we go alone and we don't send water down the creek other than what we need for the steelhead or the other you know, critters that are in the creek from benthic macroinvertebrates all the way to the tidewater goby in the, the Malibu Lagoon, um, you know, we, you know, we're investing that in our future as opposed to you know, tossing it away because of some regulation at the federal level, which is now being debunked on top of it all. So we're doing a good job, and thank you, Ricky, and your people. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Ricky. And, um, if there's nothing, else, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, yes. I, I just wanted to point out that I've noticed on my screen there is one hand raised. I, if it's a member of the public, I know this isn't a public hearing or anything, so I'm not sure you can do anything about that. But just in the chance it might be somebody from the district, I want to ask Ms. Clark if she recognizes the name Gary Burns. It's not somebody you work with, is it? 
Yes, he's a he's board. He's All right. one of our board directors. He's raised, he's raised his hand, so if you want, if you might want him to take speak. a public comment. Sure, I'm a board member. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I, uh, but I don't know how to do it. So uh, you can, if you go to the participants, you might be able to uh, let him turn on his mic so he can speak, but I don't think he'll be visible. Uh, right. Well, I'm not, I wasn't able to. Get, maybe he's been converted to a panelist. Oh, you know what? I think they're not going to promote him up now. Our, our IT staff will need to promote him to a panelist because I think the screens up here don't have that capability. Yeah, I don't see participants or anything like that. I okay, <clears throat> I do believe I'm here. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. I wasn't prepared to turn on my screen, so I won't turn on my screen. I think I could, but uh, thank you very much. And Ricky, great presentation as always. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself to everyone. Uh, and Michael, we did see each other last Saturday. Yes. Uh, I, I am the first and current uh, Calabasas resident as a member of the board. And I have been participating since December. And um, we did vote with the Joint Powers Authority. And Ricky, I don't know if you covered this, I didn't hear all of it, uh, for a $364 million uh, presentation to launch this Pure Water project. And I wanna offer my services. Anytime I can be of help, you can certainly reach out. I will help anyone from Calabasas to any of the five cities that we serve. And uh, I'm here tomorrow morning, no, uh, Saturday. Ricky, I don't know if you mentioned that. We actually have a tour for Calabasas residents. Many of the homeowners and the HOAs that I help run are uh, going to be touring the Pure Water Project. So if you, any of you want to come on Saturday morning, that would be lovely. And uh, my feeling is that we need to have as many of the politicians of the area and the state visit because we need to constantly ask for favors. We need lots of loans. And so anybody that knows of anyone that would like to take a tour, Ricky does a terrific tour. And the water does taste really, really great. And uh, uh, it's going to sit in the uh, Westlake Reservoir for six months down at the bottom. And it's going to be mixed with all the other water there. By the time it comes back out, we drink it it will be a small portion of it. And um, you may not be aware, but we spend at least now in the winter about $1 million a month buying water from Metropolitan. If this replaces 25 or 30%, that bill should go down significantly. And of course, in the next drought, which will definitely come, we should all be prepared that we will be able to be somewhat more self-sufficient. So I urge you to water your, your, your gardens as many days as you wish, stay within your budget, but we have to remember to conserve from now on for our, for our children and our grandchildren. And I'll say one last thing, uh, Jay Lewitt, who's the chair and many of the other board members are looking at desal, mm -hmm. but it's many, many, many years in the future, maybe over in the Oxnard area. It's a, a lot of questions about environmentalists and, and other people, but we are definitely looking into desal in the future. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the work you do on the Planning Commission. Thank you, Gary. And thank you for all the work you're doing on the Water Board. Uh, I am enjoying it tremendously. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, then. Uh, if there's, is there anything else? Or do we just, can we just move on to the approving the, um, the minutes then? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Ricky. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good evening. Bye-bye. Uh, and Dennis, thank you for all that information. Um, all right, so I, I, I did this, I guess, out of order. But anyway, the consent items, approval of the minutes for February 16, 2023. Does anybody have any requested changes? Yes. I have a question on page three, paragraph six and seven. Can staff confirm that that was actually done? Uh, where are you looking? I'll see what the start of the paragraph. Any proposed? After further discussion, and then any proposed? Hmm. Well, uh, the project, the project, after getting a zoning approval, which is what occurs through the planning and through the commission, still has to get building permits. So, I mean, it still has to go through the plan check process for actual construction permits. That takes a while. So, you can't say we performed on a on a uh, condition of approval when it's still going through plan review for building permits. But well, this talks about a change 
to the resolution. Commissioner Leah, are you asking if the change was made to the resolution? I'm sorry. Are you asking if the change was made to the resolution? You got to speak into the microphone. Are, are you asking if that change was made in the resolution? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Was the change yes. made? Yes, it was. And it was okay. for signatures by the chair, the city attorney, and the director. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll confirm that. Yes, the, the final resolution has that change. Um, sorry, any other changes or questions regarding the minutes? Dennis, can you hear us? <laughs> any changes to the minutes from February 16? No. So then uh, a motion. Will anybody move to? You know, to I may. You move, move to approve. Okay. A second. Second. Okay. A second is corrected. And then now we have to vote uh, independently, right? Right. Even the on the minutes. Okay. I know. Even with the minutes. And this is best. I, I wasn't at that meeting, so I'm going to abstain. You have enough. You have enough commissioners to to okay. approve okay, it without me. Hi. And John. Hi. Uh, Dennis. Yeah. Hi. And I say hi. So, okay. Um, and, uh, all right. Now uh, we have a public hearing, and this is um, variance 2023 001 and zoning clearance 2023 033, which concerns a, among other things, a 13 foot tall retaining wall grading and a fence on. A vacant parcel located at 25424 Prado de Azul, um, APN 2069-100058, owned by the Oaks Community, Community Association. So um, I believe, Jacqueline, are you going to make a presentation or Tom? or yeah, Jacqueline will make the presentation, but I do want to um, remind the commissioners that as we communicated in the written staff report, we're delivering a presentation that gives an analysis and presentation of the uh, full description of the project, but it will not include a staff recommendation. This is a new approach that we're taking forward with an intent to uh, bring a neutral position on staff and let the commission simply make its decision pro or con on a project. And then uh, we will be asking for direction to either return with a resolution of approval or return with a resolution of denial at the next meeting, which would be on the consent agenda at that time. Okay. We used to do this in the 90s, actually. The staff didn't always make recommendations. I, I'm familiar with it from my years in Indianapolis. We did it that way. And also in Santa Paula, we actually, under my direction, changed to this approach. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And But I also don't think we have to do just denial or approve the well, you can continue for sure well you can continue but you can also ask for some modifications and, and that's true and, and approve uh, uh anyway all right good so then Jacqueline do you want to begin yes thank you chair Harrison and good evening commissioners I'd like to start out by mentioning that this project was noticed to all property owners located within 500 feet of the site the notice was also posted on the city's website and throughout the city at all required locations Staff did receive a few questions from the public in regards to the specific location of the proposed wall, but no concerns were raised once the location was clarified. We also did receive several letters in support of the proposed project, and those um, letters of public correspondence have been distributed to the commission. Okay, so here you can see the location map. The subject site is located in the residential single family zoning district. Is on a, it is a vacant parcel owned by the Oaks HOA. The site is surrounded by the Santa Monica Mountains to the south and to the west, and it is surrounded by existing single family residences to the north and east. You can see here Las Virginis Road is located approximately one mile away to the west. Uh, Las Virginis Road is a designated scenic corridor, and the yellow overlay you see here is the scenic corridor overlay zone. Um, but as you can see in this image, it is approximately one mile away from the nearest public right of way, which is Las Virginis and the designated scenic corridor. So the wall will not have visibility from the um, scenic corridor from the public right of way. This is a little bit of a closer view of the subject site. Here we have an aerial map and the hillsides shown in the above image were constructed as part of the Oaks development in the early 2000s. Entitlements for this development were approved in January of 1991, which is before the city incorporated. So they were approved under LA County. 
and the grading for each individual pad and the associated engineered slopes were accomplished prior to the construction of these residences along Prado de Azul, which were constructed in 2006. So at present, the slope in question, which is indicated by the red arrow on the screen, has began to fail, and a 13-foot retaining wall has been proposed by the applicant, which is the Oaks HOA, in order to remedy the slide. And the location of the proposed retaining wall is shown in yellow here. And I want to mention on this image on the aerial map here, these five property owners, you can see my cursor on the screen, the five property owners that are located um, most closely to the wall have are the ones that uh, wrote the letters of support that were distributed to the commission. Okay, here we have photographs of the subject site. These were attached in your packets as exhibit B. The photo on the left shows, you can see in this photo, you can see my cursor there, the exposed uh, footings of the fence. And you can also see that the fence is starting to lean a bit. So the exposed footings show how much the slope has slid out from underneath the fence over the course of the past few years. The slide was first noted in 2021 and over the course of the rains over the past few rainy seasons, it's continued to get worse. The photo on the right that you can see here, these are both taken from the rear yard of the property at 25510 Pro Azul. Bless you. So you can uh, see in this image on the right, the grass in these pictures is a little bit taller due to the fact that they were taken after the most recent rain, so you can't see the slide as well. But what you can see in the photo on the right is the view out from the retaining wall, as mentioned in the location map. Uh, the wall site would not be visible by the public or from, and it would have um, no visibility from any public right of way. You can see a adjacent residence at 25516 Prado de Azul in this image. And again, that property owner and the property owner uh, from which this photo has been taken have both provided their approval of the project. Can you can you stop that for a second? And Commissioner Leah, I think you had a question about exactly how, what, what, will the retaining wall be higher than that fence or below that fence? It'll be below the fence. So yeah. you won't see it from those properties? Right. And unless they worked, and we actually have one of the homeowners here, the one that took the photo, um, if they went to the back wall, to their back fence and looked down, they'd be able to see it. What about the view from Las Virginas Road? What will be seen? It wouldn't be able to be viewed from Las Virginas Road. It's over a mile away, and there are also uh, hills in the way. You can see from this photo, um, Las Virginas Road would be in the direction that this house is in this photo. In the right-hand photo. Yeah. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. Las Virginas Road is in that direction mm -hmm. in this image, and the retaining wall would be located at a lower elevation than this fence that you're seeing here. All right, so there will not be a blot on the scenic view. Right, you can possibly see it from Las Virginis. It's blocked. Right. Is it visible from Stokes Canyon or from Mulholland? I can go back to the location. We can, I we can show you the is. map that would show that you can't see it from those yeah. locations either, it, although Stokes Canyon is neither in the city nor a scenic corridor. It would you be still a, would not be able to see it from there. Just asking the visibility from the south or the southwest. Yeah, it, it would be about a mile away, and there are a series of hills and mountains at various elevations in between. And what color is this retaining wall? I... Yeah, I, I have a, a wall elevation slide, but uh, right now it is proposed to just be a uh, finished concrete. Oh, so gray. Y yes, or, yeah. We, okay. we do have the applicant here to talk a little bit more about the design, but uh, do you have yeah. any other questions at this point? No, no, we'll have questions after okay. I mean, as well. Okay. And then we'll have the public hearing after that. Okay. So the proposal includes construction of a 13-foot maximum retaining wall on the vacant HOA-owned parcel to the south of the residences on Prado de Azul for the purpose of slope stabilization. The project involves a request for a variance for construction of a retaining wall that is over six feet in height. And Calabasas Municipal Code Section 17.62.080 requires this project be reviewed by the Planning Commission. Okay, here we have the proposed site plan. And the location of the proposed retaining wall is shown in yellow. And if you can see my cursor here, the wall is located primarily on the HOA owned property, but a portion of the wall does cross over into the adjacent parcel at 25516 Prado de Azul. And then the limits of the proposed grading, the compacted fill, also crosses over onto those adjacent residences, but the wall is primarily located on the HOA owned parcel. So 
So this parcel, uh, it's APN number 2069-100058 is 11.16 acres in total. You can see the property lines indicated by the dashed red line here. Um, maybe you would want to point out that over the course of the length of that whole wall, only about the central at two thirds is over over six foot tall. Yes, there's notations on either end of the wall right here, if you can see that on the site plan, but the edges of the wall are four feet in height. Uh, and you can see from the contour lines in here, um, this part of the slope right here at the steepest point, that is where the 13 foot retaining wall, or that was where the 13 foot portion will be located. Um, that is where the valley of this slope is, you can see on the contour lines. And here we have the proposed cross section. So the retaining wall's total height will be 13 feet, but the retaining portion of the wall will only be 12 feet. And then we have a one foot concrete portion at the top um, for the associated drainage soil that will be located behind the wall. So you can see in this image that the existing slope is a 1.5 to one slope. Um, per chapter 15 of the city's municipal code, we allow for no steeper than a two to one slope for fill surfaces. And that two to one is also an engineering standard. So the proposed compacted fill behind the wall will be a two to one slope. And in order to construct a two to one slope out of the existing 1.5 to one slope, the proposed retaining wall will be 13 feet in height. Um, and to clarify, as I mentioned earlier, since this was all constructed in 1991, if that proposed development were to be constructed today under the city's current ordinances, the 1.5 to 1 slope, the 1.5 to 1 engineered slope, which currently exists, would not be permitted today. Uh, and 2 to 1 would have been required. So that's why the backfill that they're required to do is 2 to 1. Uh, and the 13 foot wall is to accommodate a 2 to 1 slope where there is currently the 1.5 to 1. So we're not all geologists here. Can you explain the difference between the 1.5 and the 2.0 and the slope? and and, and why they have to do grading in the backyards of lots eight and nine. Yes, and we also do have the applicant's engineer here. I, I'm also not an engineer myself, and he may be able to do a better job of explaining it. But as far as what the slope uh, means, if I understand your question, for every for a two to one slope, for every two uh, horizontal feet, the slope decreases by one foot. And for a 1.5 to one slope, a 1.5 horizontal distance correlates to a one foot vertical distance. So that's a much steeper slope. Yes. So 1.5, uh, I mean, is much steeper than. Correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, 1.5 1. to one is a steep slope, which would not be allowed under our current code. And two to one would be the engineering standards that our code requires. And, and this was constructed, you'd think, in 1991 or just the permit? I mean, just the. I, you know, I don't remember if they developed all this part of the OS. Yeah, that's. It was in the early 2000s when when a lot of this was developed, so I'm not sure. Let's maybe if we go back to the plan that shows where the wall is located with the contours. Okay, if you look at the contours to the to the left of the proposed wall, which is shown with the yellow line there, those are natural contours. Those were not a graded manufactured slope in 1991 or any time after that. No, there there is fill. There's some fill in there, but it's there are no drainage features. It is not a, a man-made contour. Now, there's been failure. That's the reason this is needed. That includes area on the adjoining lot. So the erosion is occurring on not just the HOA property, but on the adjoining lot as well. So they need to stabilize all of it. Right. And they have to do it at a two-to-one slope. So the slide that she was going to get to next will show you why that's not feasible for the balance of the project if they were to carry on on the HOA land. HOA has plenty of land, sure, but it continues to descend at 1.5 to 1 or worse. And this shows what we're talking about. You can see that if you were to try to carry on a 2 to 1 slope, you're just getting farther and farther above the grade as it sits today. So if you were to try to do a series of walls, which is typically what we what we require, and stair step down to try to match that slope to eventually meet it. You'd have I don't know, eight walls, nine walls, ten because walls. Because it continues to drop. As Correct. So okay. so this is this is why this is the a good approach that is more feasible, less costly, okay. and less disruptive. All right. I have a I have a question. Do we have a geological report on 
this stand and what they're proposing to do and whether it would bring the whole mountainside down? Yes, we, we do. We typically don't include the um, soils report in the planning commission packets, but that has been reviewed by our public works department as well as preliminarily by our building and safety division. And we do have preliminary approval from public works. Building and safety does their full review following a planning decision once it's submitted to building and safety. But I have reviewed it with our plan check engineer preliminarily, and his preliminary feedback is that he would agree with the information in the report. Well, shouldn't we, we the planning commission, know what that is before we're asked to approve a project? I would think so. Well, on our end, our public works department has already reviewed it, and we have approval of that from our public works department. But typically that information, um, as Chair Harrison had mentioned earlier, since we aren't all um, engineers and experts, that technical information, that engineering information is typically reviewed by uh, public works and building and safety, and it's typically not an exhibit brought before the planning commission. Right. Just so I understand, we have a geological report from the HOA's engineers. Correct. Correct. And, and yes, he's also... Yes. Our city engineers reviewed it and has okayed it. And the key component on note is that certainly the applicant's engineer, as I understand it, is present tonight and can speak to these issues. But the engineering component is not itself one of the findings that the planning commission has to consider. The broader finding is health and safety, and this commission is entitled to rely on the city's engineer. Um, but I would suggest some of these questions could be posed to the applicant's engineer, who's, who's uh, I think, present tonight. One other question. It's clear that part of the retaining wall is going on lot nine and we and also right and, and also the grading. There's going to be grading and uh, riprap and fill on eight and nine, not just on lot. Yes. So the portion of the retaining wall that is going to be located on lot nine. I know these labels are small, but you can kind of see where it says right here. Where it crosses lot nine, the wall is only four feet in height. Okay, I uh, get it. It's, I get it. Yeah. Oh, that you said the ends are lower. Yes. In, yes, in, right. So it, right. Okay. Only the wall is 13 feet maximum, and I have an elevation that we'll get to as well. But the, it's construction on all three. Right. So the tallest part of the right. wall will be in right almost smack in the middle. Okay. And at the ends, it's less than six feet. So the only place the variance is required is for the section of the wall that's on the HOA property. Okay. I get it. And I think my next slide will help to answer that question as well. So here's the proposed wall elevation. You can see in this slide, again, the tallest point of the wall is 13 feet, and those edges of the wall are only four feet in height. Okay, and then on top of the wall, you can see in this photo, there is an existing um, metal fence that you could see in the site photographs that I showed in the earlier slide. Uh, the wall is going to be constructed below the elevation of that existing fence. Um, and as you can see, and as you could see in the photos, the footings were failing and the fence was beginning to fall. So the fence will be removed and replaced on top of the retaining wall once the retaining wall is constructed. And this is a 3D view of the subject site from Google Maps. Um, as you can see in this photo, the distance as I've measured here is about 13 feet. So shown in yellow is an approximation of where the wall is going to be located. So we've taken that 13 foot distance as measured in Google Maps, uh, overlaid the shape of the wall from the wall elevation slide and scaled it down to match the 13 feet maximum height. So this kind of shows the shape and the size of the wall in context with the houses that will be surrounding it. Okay, so there are five findings necessary for granting of a variance per Calabasas Municipal Code Section 17.62.080. Uh, the first finding is that there are special circumstances applicable to the property, which do not generally apply to other properties in the same zoning district, which would be size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, such that strict application of this chapter denies the property owner privileges enjoyed by other property owners in the vicinity and in identical zoning districts. Number two, that granting the variance is necessary for the preservation and enjoyment of substantial property rights possessed by other property owners in the same vicinity and zoning district and denied to the property owner for which the variance is sought. Number three, that granting the variance would not constitute the granting of a special privilege inconsistent with the limitations of other properties in the same zoning district. Number four, that granting the variance will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, or injurious to property or improvements in the vicinity and zoning district in which the property is located. And number five, that granting the variance is consistent with the general plan and any applicable specific plan. And the applicant's proposed findings for proposed justification for the variance findings is attached as Exhibit C to the written staff report. 
Moving on to staff conclusions. The proposed project will not alter the existing use of the subject site, which is an allowed use in the RS zoning district. Regarding applicable development standards, a variance is being sought for greater wall height than is allowable under section 17.20.100 of the Calabasas Municipal Code. And the proposed project is compatible in design, appearance, and scale with the surrounding uses. Additionally, the Public Works Department has approved the preliminary grading and drainage plan for the proposed project. And the project is also exempt from CEQA review under section 15061 subsection B3, section 15303 subsection E, and section 15304 subsection C of the CEQA guidelines. But based on staff's preliminary analysis of the plans and associated reports, staff believes the required findings for variance can be justified. So with that, the recommended action by staff is that the commission direct staff to prepare a resolution for approval or a resolution for denial of file numbers VAR-2023-001 and ZCL-2023-033, inclusive of all required findings to support the resolution. So staff is prepared to assist the commission in developing the findings for variance as required. Thank you, and I'm available for questions. And as mentioned, we do also have the applicant here and their engineer on as well. The applicant being, okay. Um, thank you for your report. Um, First, we'll go to questions, and then I'll open the public hearing, if that's okay. So, Commissioner Fassberg, do you have questions? I, no, actually, excellent presentation that answered all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brain. No questions. Uh, Commissioner Moore. No, thank you, Chuck. No questions. Commissioner Leah. Yes. Oh, then, uh, Dennis, if, I don't know where you are in the ether out there. I don't see your picture, but do you have any questions? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Now you. I, I turned the camera back on, um, and um, I'm fine. I'm fine with uh, the uh, the assessment and analysis, and I'm waiting to see if there's any objection from the other commissioners in order to understand, you know, where the uh, difficulties may be, if any. At this point, it just seems like. Um, it's an appropriate solution. I'll bet you it's expensive, which is sad, but, uh, you know, we have circumstances around the city like this on Park Aura and elsewhere. And one of the things I would caution everybody about is that the insurance companies are not really helping any of the homeowner associations in California deal with these kinds of issues. So if there's something we get out of this by helping the homeowner association in this area, and move this thing forward in a way that, you know, helps us get the aid or the insurance coverage that might be available. I, I'm all for that. Otherwise, I think it was a good report and I wouldn't have, want to face this myself. Thank you, Dennis. Actually, it's hard to even get insurance sometimes, uh, even by HOAs. Exactly. Um, I have a couple questions. One is on this, what I'm going to call this lot 29, the HOA. Uh, parcel. Um, can it be developed? It's zone single family, residential, you know, our single family. And in, in terms of the zoning or in terms of can somebody can they somebody put a structure on it, a house or something? No, or the court? staff approvals will block that. So so it's part of the development agreements. Yeah, the original is, approvals okay. set block that. I mean, I don't think it's a good place for one, but I was just yeah. wondering it's zoned that way, which is odd. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure the history of why that's zoned um, instead of open space or something. OM instead of an open space zone. But my understanding yeah. is the track map blocks it. Good. Okay. The second question is: Can the wall color be a little more um, like the earth, like you know, maybe sand or beige or something instead of gray? I think um, the applicant would probably better be able to answer that question. Okay. If you want to open the public hearing yet, or yeah, no, that's the only question I have. So other questions. So yes, let's go open. Let's let's open the public hearing. Maybe we uh, have comments from the applicant and the people in the audience. Hello, how are you guys doing tonight? Great, good. Uh, to um, address some of your questions, which kind of uh, leads into the question about the. Uh, oh. Wait, well, I I'm think, sorry. Could you just tell us who you are and oh, where, where you reside? Or? I'm so sorry. Uh, my name is Ron Rosolio, and uh, I reside in that lot right there. The um, one where we just approved the your lot eight. Lot eight. Is that the, the one? The one where we approved yes, the sir. pool. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I've been working with the HOA in, in the course of um, this project because it impacts all the access points to uh, construct the wall is through lot eight, uh, most of them. 
So we kind of been in collaboration as far as the process of, of the wall. So um, Jack, if we can reference that, uh, that one aerial shot that, that shows the five laws, kind of like in a bowl. Yeah, that one right there. So just want to address to where kind of we're on site. And the way that the mounts are configured is that it's kind of like a bowl. And then where the, where the wall lies, you have the, the top of the property, and then it's one foot, and then there's five foot of the fence line, and then the wall drops. So what happens from a visibility standpoint, the wall is, is low enough to where with the bowl, the on both sides of the bowl of the mountains, it's kind of blocking it because it's it's low and in the middle of the bowl. So when we stood on the outskirts of the right side of the bowl, and we tried looking back, you'd be looking down about five to eight feet before you even saw the top of the wall. So it's actually the top of the wall is lower than where the existing fence is. So um, to kind of address your concerns about uh, the color of the wall, sure, I mean, that's, we can always do that, but just to reiterate, it, it is in the bowl and lower and the visibility. So, so it's not very visible, oh, no, course, except for your lots, eight, nine, and- Yeah, we went to each lot when we, on all the names unanimously signed off on it. And we went to the furthest lot on the right and the left, we looked over, we saw, okay, it's because there's a hill and it's below the hill of the two lots that are on either sides of the, of the bowl. So, so I'm sorry, Ron, you're the, you're the owner of lot eight, but you're also the applicant? I, I'm confused. No, I'm sorry, the applicant is the HOA. I'm oh. working with them. Are I, you the developer? Are you the builder? I, I'm the owner. Yeah, I mean, it's owner occupied the, the house. But are you also going to be constructing this or? No, the HOA isn't constructing. Ah, okay. It's through my lot, but we've been collaborating with But you're the one, we, okay. Yes. Ah. So if you want to. So yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering if they can make a more neutral color that blends. Chairman Harrison and commissioners, good evening. I'm Jennifer Buffiti. I am the president of the Oaks of Calabasas Homeowners Association. We're actually the applicant in this matter. Uh, the first issue I just want to emphasize is this is a matter of safety for us. Uh, there is a huge uh, gaping hole in the back of Mr. Resilio's property. Uh, it's definitely not getting any better with the weather and the quicker that we can address this. Uh, the better for the Homeowners Association. As you have mentioned, our insurance does not cover us at all for this matter. And we're having to fund it out of uh, our, our HOA uh, reserve funds. <clears throat> um, secondly, we have every interest in making the wall as aesthetically pleasing as possible. If there is a suggestion or a preference with regards to color, we are absolutely happy to go forward and, and make sure that is, it blends into the background as much as possible. Well, maybe Commissioner Byrne, are you? Are there ways to just add coloring to make it a little more? Oh, absolutely, the wall can be painted. You can use colored concrete, colored shotcrete. So I think that is something. That's about the only thing that I was interested in seeing is that the the thing didn't wasn't white or gray or something that stands out. If it can blend with the color of the adjoining hillside, that would be the only thing I would ask for. Yeah, Commissioner Byrne, I think we share the same interest here. I mean, we have the, we want to make it blend in. So however we can do that, the most pressing issue for us though, is to get that wall up and constructed because this, the integrity of the slope relies upon it. Yeah, I believe that it's an appropriate method of repair and the variance process is in place for exactly things like this. Uh, and so as long as we can make the uh, wall uh, least uh, as as little uh, uh, you know obvious as possible and blend with the existing. Then I think that it's a perfect case. He's not gaining any level pad by doing this, uh, so uh, the homeowner is not getting much out of this at all. Uh, besides stabilizing, I would mention that the fact that maybe there's some erosion occurring there because the pad slopes uh, off to the top of the slope there, and you look at the spot elevations on the pad and it slopes. The pad at, uh, at least the end of the pad slopes towards that um, swale or that uh, that depression where we're having erosion. So there is some probably some contribution from poor pad drainage locally, but this seems to be the appropriate uh, type of fix for this. I do have He's a related, geologist. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do have a related question and it's probably for my fellow commissioner to my right. Um, since, this, since this wall will not be visible it sound it sounds like this wall will not be visible from pretty much anywhere um how much would it how much is it going to add to the cost to the hoa uh, to add color to the wall it's a significant it's a significant amount of of concrete or shotcrete whatever they're going to use um are we talking about a significant increase in cost if we require uh, a particular color? 
I mean, as a planning commissioner, that's sort of beyond my purview in, in this seat here. Uh, but as in knowing about construction and these types of things, I look at these all the times, coloring the face of the wall, uh, the cost of that is probably minuscule with respect to the cost of construction. I'll just yeah, stand there. Yeah, yeah. Piles or, or yeah, that's an expensive that's, wall. It's it's expensive to build these. And so coloring the concrete should not be a significant uh, part of this. And the engineer can, you know, their engineer can chime in if he wants. I was just going to say, I did uh, a large pad in my house that I had colored in the color staining, if you will, didn't cost much at all. You can either stain or you can blend it with concrete. Okay. Yep. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, well, well, we're not there. We're no, uh, later. We're, we're still getting this. Still, the public hearing part. So, okay. Are there are there any other comments from? You said the applicants, uh, engineers here. I mean, are there any other comments from uh, anybody who's perhaps out there in the online or Dennis? I don't. <laughs> well, do we have questions of the engineer? Yeah, I don't. I don't have any questions, so I, I, I don't know any. I, I, don't, I don't have any. No, no, no I don't either. Okay, so then I guess that's it. Thank you for coming tonight, thank and uh, and thank you for coming. Sorry, Chair Harrison, we do actually have the engineer's hand raised in the public. If you did have any questions for him, I just saw that um, we have that hand raised. If there was anything else, no, none of us had, uh, none of us seem to have any questions, any further questions. Did the engineer want to speak at public comment just to speak or public hearing? Would you like me to allow him to speak? If he wishes, he may. Of course. Uh, yes, hello, Joe. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to comment. Yes, there's the option of the color additive to the concrete or you can uh, stock it with a much more variety of colors. So this does not sound like a significant issue. Oh, those, those, yeah, the engineering is gonna be expensive, but uh, thank you so much. All right, then uh, if there's nothing else, then we can close the public hearing and go to comments by commissioners, I think. Um, so- I have no ask. comment, but I'm, I, I'm prepared to, to make a motion. Did you close the hearing? I yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. If I didn't, uh, yes. And we can discuss further if we have a motion sure. before. Go ahead. Um, I move that we direct staff to prepare a resolution for approval uh, of file number VAR 2023 001 and ZCL 2023 033, inclusive of all required findings to support the resolution. <laughs> Um, and I sense that we want to make the added provision that uh, a color be used for the wall that allows it to blend as much as possible into the surrounding, uh, surrounding area. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. second the motion, Dennis. Okay, well, whoever got that. Um, but now we have comments, um, further comments. Do you, do you have any further comments? No comments. Um, Commissioner Muller? Were, were I voting, I would support it. Well, okay, and Commissioner Lee, you have some questions. I have a comment for, for comments. the attorney and actually sure. for any of the other attorneys. Uh, There's a few of them for that. Uh, the variance, number one, I think this is a torturous stretch. <laughs> Of number one, I agree there's a problem. I know we need to do something, but I just see that we are stretching this thing. Well, if you look at I, the map on I, page three, every house along the border faces the same issues. This is a this is a problem I discussed with the city attorney. Uh, it's because they're using the word property instead of saying all three lots. It doesn't make any sense, actually, the way it's worded, because it's not the disadvantaged property. It seems to me lot eight and nine are more at risk than uh, lot 29 or whatever it is. So, I mean, I, I agree with you. This is it's the problem of their wording. Um, and I think it can be tweaked. But and I spoke to, to you, Matt, I, I don't know if 
Commissioner Fassberg would agree to this, but so so like if uh, on on the fourth line of the first finding, I would say denies the property owners, not the owner, because it doesn't deny, deny the oaks privileges enjoyed by the other property owners. It doesn't make sense that it only applies to the HOA property. They don't have any. Well, but the problem is that says. the requirements, the five requirements, are the five requirements. Right, but if they change the 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 definition of property or to, they actually use like five different words for property. They say, they say property, site, subject, property. If they change it to properties, plural, and, and identify lots eight, nine, and 29, because they all have construction on them. They've all got grading and compacting and building. If they change it to all of them, then it makes sense. The property owners are denied well, they're denied a, a yard that isn't collapsing. But the problem is we have one applicant here. Well, the, uh, the applicant, applicant is the HOA. Have, no, I agree. We only have one applicant, but I don't know if it if the applicant, if it can't apply to all three properties. Matt. Matt, do you want to weigh yeah, in? Yeah, happy to weigh in. So I think staff doesn't have an objection if the variance findings are tested against all of the properties in which the wall will be constructed. The variance component, the, the need for the variance is the 13 foot height, which is only on the HOA property. The 13 foot height is, is not taller than six feet on the two side properties, but the wall is one wall that will be on all three of them with all three of them involving grading, grading and footings and so forth. So I think staff would have no objection where the commission to support it to draft a resolution that would tie the findings and the unique circumstances back to um, this little bowl, if you will, that's failing because of some combination of poor original design and the ravages of time and weather, uh, given particularly the more recent, the robust storms we've seen recently, that would, if it fails, knock out all three of them. So I think we would have no objection to the proposed adjustment to the findings to reflect uh, all three properties on which the wall sits. So, because then it makes sense if you say it denies the property owners privileges enjoyed by other property owners in the vicinity, then to me that makes sense. Yeah, I, I understand what Bob is saying because you say denies the HOA the privileges enjoyed by other property owners. If they're, they're not even using that property, let alone in just, the HOA's case, the privilege being granted is to not have to face the liability that would that they would face if the slope fails. Yeah, they're but not think, using the property so much as they need it to be stable. Right. And the same so, thing with the second, with B, it says the proposed retaining wall is essential to eliminating the safety hazard to the adjacent properties. Um, that's not really, I mean, it's the adjacent properties that are are in at risk, not to me, not so much lot 29. So um, I think it's better if we tie all uh, them all together. Th then it so makes you're sense proposing to, to say the properties? In the finding, uh, I in the in the yes exactly in a and I have no problem amending the the motion to read properties. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, that works for me. Yeah. Is that okay then? Okay. Well, you can tweak it. I think you right. You, you understand. Exhibit C is the the applicants drafted their proposed findings drafted for the commission. These are not drafted by us. Yeah. So um, not drafted by staff, not drafted by me. So we will take this direction from the commission and take it into a resolution and turn next time. Right. right. Oh, okay. Right. So if, yeah, if, that was one right. key clarification. That was what I was trying to convey in my introduction, that you all will decide on whether this should go forward with us preparing a resolution of approval, for example. And that, in that case, we would articulate the findings and they would not just be what the applicant provided. They'll include the types of things you're talking about. Okay, it looks like Dennis has his hand up. Uh, and the, the reason, Michael, is that um, it's, it's actually the intelligence of this approach, which is to prepare a resolution for approval. Um, our only decision tonight is to prepare the um, resolution for approval, but uh -oh. with additional issues, conditions, and language fixes that you all have brought up tonight. So. We'll see on our next agenda probably a resolution which either will meet or come awfully close to meeting all the things that we've talked about tonight without having to, you know, trammel up the resolution itself at this point because it'll come to the next meeting. Okay. All right. So any any other discussion from anybody here? Anybody over here, Dennis? Okay. Um, 
then let's vote. We have to vote individually. So commission aye. Mr. Password. I uh I uh, I say I Dennis. Are you I'm also in favor. Okay. And John would be. <laughs> so, so with that, we'll move forward and prepare a resolution that makes the findings for approval, and that'll return to your next meeting on consent. Thank you for coming tonight. Yeah, thank uh, you. We appreciate thank it. And thanks for taking care of us. This is uh, something that's not going to go away, I don't think. It's just probably going to get worse uh, over time. So um, next, we have the director's report. Well, you get to hear from me instead of Michael because uh, enviously he's on vacation. Um, all I want to tell the commissioners is we do anticipate you will be meeting next time, April 20th, and we have two projects that we're just, I believe, issuing the public notices for today. Rose's Garden Bar, and which is a condition use permit in the 522 to Dante's View, which is a site plan review. I don't have any other items to share with you. When, when will that meeting? When is our next meeting? April 20. Oh, okay. So it's a regular meeting then. Right. Regular meeting. Uh, I will at least inform the commission that the circulate, or actually the safety element of our general plan update that uh, the commission recently reviewed has been through the Board of Forestry and their review just this week, and they're approving it. And we should get the written documentation to that effect next week. So we're anticipating taking it at city council um, within about three or four weeks. I forget the date of the hearing of the meeting. It's uh, April 26th. Thank you, Tom. In fact, I just signed this a resolution, PC resolution 2023-746 regarding the safety element and the trans uh, traffic or element. Yes. Thank you. The board actually was highly complimentary of our safety element. The board of forestry. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good to know. All right. So now we have reports from planning commissioners. Any, any planning commissioners wish to, wish to report on anything? No. No. Okay. Dennis? No. I do want to mention one thing, unfortunately. Um, uh, Emma will be passed away. She, oh. um, I served with her on the... Um, Environmental Standards Committee and the Environmental Commission. She was a founding member of the Tree Board and active in this community. And uh, she volunteered countless hours uh, for our community. So I just wanted to adjourn in her honor, if that's okay. Absolutely. And so, uh, do we have to make a motion on adjournment and get everybody's uh, vote yes, on that? That's fine. <laughs> All right. So. Then we'll adjourn in honor of Emma Willoughby to the next meeting on April 20th. Thank you very much, everyone. And if, Michael, if I can just add, you know, oh. I, I worked with, um, you know, John and Emma, you know, on incorporating the city, and they were very active in dealing with uh, that and were influential in bringing the Mulwood Homeowners Association along with uh, all the advocates for incorporation in the first place. And they've been involved since literally the, you know, early 80s, I'd say. And, you know, our sympathies go to John and to, you know, everybody who was a friend of um, Emma. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, well, with that, then good evening, and we'll, we'll be back on April 20th. Thank you.